Good afternoon. I'm Alan Solomon, Dean of Tufts University's Jonathan M. Tisch College of Civic Life. Welcome to the Edward R. Morrow Forum on Issues in Journalism, part of the Tisch College Distinguished Speaker Series. We're honored to host veteran newsman Chris Wallace, host of Fox News Sunday, and one of the most respected broadcast journalists in the country. This is the 14th Edward R. Morrow Forum at Tufts. Since its inception, this event has brought to campus some of the leading lights in American journalism, among them Dan Rather, Tom Brokaw, Katie Couric, Christian Amanpour, George Stephanopoulos, Lester Holt, Anderson Cooper, and many more. It's a pleasure for us to host this forum alongside the Morrow Center for a Digital World at the Fletcher School and the Film and Media Studies program in the School of Arts and Sciences. I wanna give a special thanks to our colleague and Tufts faculty member, Julie Dobrow, for all her work on this important program. At Tisch College, we're committed to ensuring that all Tufts students can learn, debate, and act on the most pressing issues facing our democracy. Understanding the news media is a crucial component of civic learning, particularly at a time when the media has undergone radical changes and when informing an American public increasingly divided on basic facts presents new challenges. With 50 years of experience as a journalist and having seen many of these dynamics firsthand, the insights and perspective of today's guests will surely make for a great conversation. And it's now my honor to introduce him. Chris Wallace is the anchor of Fox News Sunday, the network Sunday morning public affairs program. Since joining the Fox News channel in 2003, Chris has covered nearly every, every major political event during this time, and he has conducted high profile interviews with international dignitaries and US leaders, including Donald Trump for his first interview after being elected president, Russian President Vladimir Putin, President of France, Emmanuel Macron, and President Barack Obama, to name just a few. Since the 1980s, he has covered countless presidential debates, nominating conventions, and national political stories. He was the first Fox News journalist to moderate a general election presidential debate in 2016. And more recently, he moderated the first presidential debate between Donald Trump and President Joe Biden. Prior to joining Fox News, Chris worked at ABC News for 14 years, where he was the senior correspondent for Primetime Thursday and an occasional host of Nightline. Wallace began his network journalism career with NBC in 1975 and eventually became chief White House correspondent, anchor of the Sunday edition of Night NBC Nightly News and moderator of Meet the Press. He is the only person to have ever hosted two Sunday talk shows. Wallace began his career in the news business as a teenager when he worked as an assistant to Walter Cronkite during the 1964 Republican National Convention. As a student at Harvard, he reported news on air for the student radio station. And when he covered the student occupation of University Hall during the Harvard strike, he was detained by Cambridge police. He used his one permitted phone call to sign off a report from a Cambridge jail saying, this is Chris Wallace from WHRB News reporting from Middlesex County Jail in custody. During his 50 plus years in broadcasting, Chris Wallace has won every major broadcast news award for his reporting, including three Emmys, the DuPont Columbia Silver Baton, the Peabody Award, the Paul White Award for Lifetime Achievement, and many more. Moderating today's conversation with Chris Wallace is our own Tufts trustee, and distinguished alumnus, Neil Shapiro. Neil is the president and CEO of WNET in New York City, the largest public media enterprise in the United States, reaching 7 million viewers per week. WNET presents the highest quality arts, edu arts education, history and news and public affairs programming on three broadcast stations, 13, WLIW21, and NJTV. Since joining WNET in 2007, Neil has revitalized programming at all three stations. He's nearly doubled arts and cultural offerings. He's emphasized local programming and community engagement. He set new fundraising records and he's launched two new studios, the Tisch WNET studio at Lincoln Center 
in the Agnes Vera studio in Newark, New Jersey. Previously, Neil was president of NBC News with responsibility for its top rated programs, including the Today Show, NBC Nightly News and Meet the Press, as well as Dateline NBC of which he was executive producer. Neil also spent 13 years at ABC News where he was a writer and producer for Primetime Live and World News Tonight. Over the course of his 35 year career, Neil has won numerous awards, including 32 Emmys, 31 Edward R. Murrow Awards and three Columbia DuPont Awards. He graduated magna cum laude from Tufts in 1980, having majored in history and political science. And in 2008, he was elected to the Tufts Board of Trustees where he continues to serve the university. And if his professional media experience weren't enough, he is married to Juju Chang, co-anchor of ABC Night News Nightline, and they have three beautiful children. Thank you, Neil, for your partnership on the Murrow Lecture and for leading today's conversation. I'm delighted to hand it over to you now. Thank you, Alan. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Chris, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, one of the things we always care right, about right away is uh, the relationship between the president and the press. So I thought I'd begin and ask you about President Trump. Um, fair to say, not a, big, not a big fan of yours. Well, you know, it's an interesting thing. I'm not sure that he isn't uh, a fan. Um, the, the New York Times did a, um, a rather long, uh, all of the mean tweets from 2015 to 2021, and I had a whole section in there, which incidentally I have framed and on my mantelpiece, in which he says, uh, I'm a, a Mike Wallace wannabe, um, and, and, and uh, uh, nasty and obnoxious. Incidentally, when he said nasty and obnoxious, I was talking to my eldest son who's 45, and, I, and he said, you know, nasty, no. Obnoxious, well, maybe. Um, <laughs> But the, uh, the reason I push back a little bit on this is so much of what Trump does is, is transactional and is motivated by the kind of the art of the deal in uh, New York real estate. And I suspect if uh, you know, we ended up in the same room today, he it would all kind of be forgotten. He'd be, hey, Chris, how are you? Um, you know, I think a lot of it is, is for show and for what he perceives as an advantage. And a lot of it, I don't know that he, that he really either means or is particularly personal. And all you have to do is look at all the people who have been in favor with Donald Trump and then out of favor and then back in favor. I don't really care whether I'm in favor or not, uh, but, but I, I, you know, I, don't, I don't know. And, and I suspect it changes from day to day. So what, take Nick, the, when you interviewed him in the White House in, in July, right, an interview which, which a lot of observers thought it was a disaster for him. You corrected him uh, many times because he often misstated facts, you pushed back. At one point when he boasted about how well he did on the cognitive test, you told him I've taken the same test, it's not that hard to count backwards from seven, let's do it together. Uh, what's it like to interview him? Is it a particularly challenging thing compared to all the other presidents and vice presidents and leaders you've talked to? Actually, I find it kind of, I, I found it kind of easy. And the reason I say that is because the president has certain lines he uses. And, you know, oftentimes one of the toughest things in preparing for an interview is, you know, figuring out what question you're, at, you're gonna ask and then how you're gonna respond, follow up to his answer. Well, you don't, in most cases, you don't know what the answer is gonna be. With Donald Trump, you kind of did because once he got something fixed in his head, he was gonna say it even if it had been repeatedly Criticized. So, for instance, right at the beginning of the interview in, in uh, July of this of last year, um, I was talking to him about cases, and this was at the point where there had been a whole new surge. You know, he he was constantly talking down COVID, and there had been a uh, a, a big surge right at the beginning in March and April, where you had as many as thirty five thousand cases a day. Uh, and then it had gone down, and then in July it had gone back up. So now there were 70,000 cases. And in fact, we were doing the interview not in a studio, we were doing it at the White House outside on a patio, but I had had my staff prepare uh, a, a, a graphic, uh, you know, a little poster board that I brought out and I showed them and I even said, you know, you can see the curve goes here, down, and then it comes back up. 
And he immediately pushed back and said, that's cases. And I said, well, no, it's cases. But in fact, we're, uh, we're seventh among leading industri industrial nations in deaths. And he, he said, you know, that's not true. We're number one, which I knew he was going to say because he said it repeatedly. And I said, no, in fact, we're seventh. And then I thought somewhat foolishly, he said, Kaylee, come find the numbers. And he finds the numbers. And they turn out that's true. But my point is that he once he gets a fact in his head he sticks with the fact so it really does provide you an opportunity not only to know you know the serve you're going to hit in a tennis match but where he's going to hit the return so you can be there prepared for it so talk to me about the reaction you got first of all, i'm interested in all and in, in the reaction from the audience itself you've done a lot of tough interviews with, with people um the fox audience we know tends to vote much more towards republicans in the way that msnbc tends to vote much more for democrats so when you do a tough interview with hillary clinton versus a tough interview with Donald Trump. What kind of feedback do you get from the audience? Well, uh, you, do, you wouldn't want to read my emails uh, right away. And, and the funny thing is the exact same exchange can get diametrically opposed uh, re reactions depending on people's politics. And, and a lot of times, not, not often, but sometimes my father's brought into it by both the right and the left. So that if it's a conservative, they'll say, you're just like your father, you're a communist. And mm -hmm. if they're a liberal, they'll say, your father must be ashamed of you and spinning in his grave. Uh, you know, it, look, it's not my first rodeo. I've been doing this literally for 50 years. I can't believe it. But uh, for those of you students out there, let me tell you, savor it because it, fl <laughs> it flashes by in, a, in the snap of a finger. Uh, but you know, you kind of get used to the noise. And the first time I got a mean tweet from Trump as president, I will say it got my attention because I'd never been attacked in that kind of personal way in a tweet from by the president of the United States. But but you know, at a certain at pretty quickly, you kind of uh, you, you you know you kind of it kind of uh, washes off your back. If it doesn't, you're in the wrong business. And I'm interested about the reaction in-house. So the, the, especially the primetime hosts at Fox, many of them are very consistent supporters of the president or have been. And I am wondering what, what, when you do a tough interview with the president, do you hear from them? Do you hear from management? Uh, I don't hear from, uh, from the uh, primetime hosts. Uh, sometimes I'll make some crack on the air, but it's not like they email me. And I'm, I'm frankly not very close with, with most of them. In, in terms of, and one of the reasons I've been at Fox now for 17 and a half years is I've had nothing but support from management. Uh, in my 17 and a half years, I've never been questioned on a guest that I've booked or a question that I've asked a guest that I've booked. Um, you know, they, they keep me on the air. I'm the host of our main public affairs show. I'm the chief political analyst. I'm on election night. I'm on, and you know, they, for whatever reason, they keep me there, and as long as they do, and they uh, are back me, and they have been very supportive. Roger Ailes, when he was there, was utterly supportive. When I had my first interview, job interview with him, he said, I got one question for you, and I kind of went, uh-oh. And he said, will you be just as tough on Democrats as you will be on Republicans? And I said, absolutely. I, you know, that's my DNA. And he, he never second-guessed me. So... You know, they let me do what I want. And as you well know, in our business, the news business, uh, to be an on-air anchor and to let them do, for the bosses to let you do what you do is pretty rare. And uh, so I'm, I'm happy. I want to talk to you about the debate. Uh, it's, first, it's an honor to host the debate. You did it before. The most recent one I want to talk to you about because I've seen you control lots of interviews. We've worked together and I've always marveled your ability to say, I don't want to talk about this, I want to talk about this. That debate, as you'll remember, ended up being so raucous, uh, interruptions mostly from the president, that the next time they had to put automatic microphone cutoffs because they, they didn't trust the president to behave himself. I wonder if there were a thought bubble over your head as you were doing that debate, what was going through your mind? Well, um, as Alan mentioned, I, I had done a debate in 2016 and I was the first and still the only Fox anchor ever to moderate. Now we've done primary debates where it's just the Republicans, but this is a general election debate between the two candidates, one of whom in, in a few weeks will be the next president of the United States. I did it in 2016 with, with Clinton and Trump 
uh, 80 million people watched. Uh, it, you know, it, I will say as somebody I, I, I talk about, you know, being experienced and uh, not my first rodeo, I will say in that particular case, it was something I had never done. And there were times when I would get these waves of anxiety and, and literally think, I don't know if I can handle this. And just a quick story, I'm about to go on to the stage uh, to moderate the debate in 2016. And I literally look up, I'm in the wings, like the audience can't see me. And I look up and I say, dear Lord, if you will get me through these next 90 minutes, I promise I will never ask you for anything ever again. Well, the debate went great. And actually I got kind of praised for even handed uh, moderation by both sides. When I left the stage and I went back, I stopped in exactly the same spot uh, where I had made my prayer 90 minutes before. And I looked up and I said, dear Lord, I know what I said 90 minutes before, but I get one more debate in 2020. <laughs> well, unfortunately he answered, he or she answered my prayer. The interesting thing was, so now I'm coming to the 2020 debate and I'm feeling, you know, I've done it once and that makes a huge difference. And it, it went well. And I, the, one of the things that kind of surprised me as I'm sitting there waiting for them to come on the stage is I'm feeling pretty good about this. I think I can handle this. And they come out and, and I had never watched the 2016 debate until about a week before the 2020 debate because I had a good memory. And as you uh, know from being in the same business, Neil, sometimes your recollection of something is better than the reality of it. When you watch it on, on tape, you go, oh, that wasn't quite as good as I thought it was. So I was happy to go with the memory. When I watched the debate, a week before uh, the 2020 debate, I thought, you know, there were parts of this that were really good and there were parts of it. And this is your sort of your biggest fear as a moderator is that it became simultaneous news conferences, Sec Secretary Clinton on the Middle East, uh, Trump on the Middle East, and they're not engaging. They're basically having side by side news conferences. And what you really want them to do most of all is to engage. So when the debate begins, in, in 2020, and almost immediately, Trump starts interrupting Biden. I, my immediate reaction was, this is great because this is a debate, they're gonna engage with each other and, and you know, they're really gonna mix it up. And the one thing you said that, that, that is not quite accurate, you said you control, that I, I'm good at controlling interviews. I think I am. A debate is not an interview. And one of the things that I'm very conscious of and. And, and, and I think it's right, is that it's not about you, it's about the two of them and that you're, you know, my feeling about debates and moderating was it was a little bit like being the referee in a championship prize fight. If at the end of the fight, people say that was a hell of a fight, by the way, who, who ref that? Then you've done a great job as a moderator. If they're talking about the ref, you, you failed. So my immediate reaction was to sit back, let them work it out. Uh, it became clear at a certain point that, that Trump was just determined to try to disrupt the debate and to rattle uh, Biden. When you say he interrupted, uh, some poor person at Fox had to count it up. He interrupted either Biden or me 145 times in 90 minutes, which is a pretty impressive number. So, you know, at a certain point, I, and I wish I'd done it sooner, uh, I, you know, I said, I almost called a timeout and basically said, look, this isn't the debate. This isn't helping anybody. Can we please? And, and uh, Trump said, well, why are you directing that at me? And I said, because uh, you're, you're doing most of the interrupting, Mr. President. Um, in the, I, I came away with two thoughts. I was very disappointed at the time. I thought, you can't believe the amount of work my researcher and I had done and, you know, prepared these questions and trying to make them even handed. And, you know, fine tuning them so that they were precise and, and quick and to the point and, and accurate. Uh, and that we have, we had a hard ball, you know, a fastball for one, we had a fastball for the other. If we had a slider for one, we had a slider for the other. Um, I don't think it would have made any difference. You know, uh, despite my, the fact that I, even to this day, will sometimes think to myself, what could I have done differently? I think that Trump had just made a decision. That was his plan going in, I'm gonna disrupt uh, Biden, and I think I can throw him off if I do it. Secondly, in the end, although it was not the debate that I hoped for in terms of being a serious, meaningful uh, exchange of ideas, you do want to be part of something that's important in terms of the election. 
And I actually think <laughs> that debate was a, a very big moment in, in the election and may, may in the end have lost the election for Donald Trump. You know, he, he, he did do pretty well despite, uh, did very well, 74, 75 million votes, despite COVID and a lot of other things. He lost, he took about a three or four or five point hit in the polls after that debate. You know, there's that one, one moment you talked about being prepared for something. There's a moment when you sort of challenge him about, right, will you denounce any right wing groups? Right, it's a very fast exchange. You say the Proud Boys, he says, all right, uh, stand by, stand back, stand by, right? Was that something you thought might happen? Were you prepared for that? Or was that just in the, in the moment? Well, I, I asked him the question because, you know, he has had lots of opportunities over the four years and then even before, but, you know, we all remember Charlottesville where there is something involving right wing extremists that he is unwilling to just denounce them. And, and you know, he had been talking so much in, in the weeks leading up about the election being rigged. You know, people say, well, my God, why did you ask? You asked him in 2016, you asked him again in the September, I mean, in the July interview in the White House, you asked him again in the September debate, uh, you know, will you accept the results of the election? Well, you know, I, I, I kept asking him it because he kept talking about it and kept refusing to do it. You know, there are a lot of questions that you don't ask people because they don't raise it, but he kept raising it and he kept raising his reluctance to or unwillingness to call out right wing extremism. And you know, when instead of saying I denounce it, he said, Proud Boys stand back and stand by, my reaction was, Whoa, that's that's not a you know, that is not a denunciation. In fact, far from it. And obviously that became a bigger issue as we went through the post-election period and then January 6th. Let's talk about January 6th. You and I won a Polk Award when we did a big story about neo-Nazis. And at the time, it was such a wake-up call, this growth of neo-Nazis in, in Europe. So fast forward to January 6th. Were you surprised about what happened? And do you think we of the media have maybe missed I, to pay enough attention to right-wing extremism as opposed to left-wing extremism or international terrorism? Oh, I was absolutely shocked uh, when it happened. You know, I uh, during that endless career that I've had that Alan was so nice to mention, I spent two years as the, uh, as the congressional correspondent for NBC News. So I, you know, I was in those halls. I was in the House chamber and in the Senate and, and you know, all the spots in between. And, uh, you know, we were on the air live, uh, Fox News was, because we were covering uh, the president's speech and then the certification of the vote. And we knew there were going to be challenges. And suddenly to see this mob come up on, uh, uh, on you know, Capitol Hill and storm the Capitol and then, you know, seeing people with Confederate flags walking back and forth in Statuary Hall in the rotunda. Um, that was one of the more extraordinary live events I've ever covered. Um, you know, obviously I was aware of the fact I asked it in the presidential debate about right wing extremism. Was I, was I conscious or sensitive to the fact that it was as big, as virulent, uh, and as mobilized as it turned out to be on January 6th? No. And, you know, I think that there are a, a variety of stories that the media, and, and particularly that Trump has tapped into, that the media uh, has been insensitive to. The fact that he won in 2016 and the frustration of people in uh, the upper Midwest, uh, flyover country, as it's sometimes called, and, and that they voted in such numbers for Donald Trump and their alienation from the establishment and the system and the, 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 the downside of globalization. That was a story we missed. And you know, I think people were much more sensitive to that <clears throat> in 2020, but the, this sort of right wing thing, while we'd certainly seen it, for instance, the, the fatalities and some of the counter demonstrations in Portland, I don't think we were as aware. I think uh, January 6th still came as quite a su shocking surprise. I want to talk oh. about um, fake news. And by that, I mean, I mean things that truly are fake, the things, right, things are repeated over and over again, which are not true. And I've seen you on your show many times. People will say that there was widespread fraud in the election. You'll say that's not true, right? Um, there are many journalists who've done that on broadcast, not all journalists, but on broadcast and print over and over again. And yet, a huge amount of the country still believes the election was stolen and there was widespread fraud. Is that frustrating to you? Oh, sure. 
Sure. I mean, and, and you know, I've seen, uh, you know, polls in the last month, the number of people, I don't know, it's roughly, well, it's about as big as the, as the Trump vote, but whether it's 30 or 40 percent, and when you get to Republicans, it's a majority who still don't think that Joe Biden is the duly elected president. It's enormously frustrating, but as a, as a reporter, as an anchor, the only thing you can do is call it out when it's, when it's uh, and you know, there have been times, uh, I'm just trying to think, I, I, I had uh, Rick Scott, the Senator from Florida, who's the head of the National Republican Senatorial Committee, and, uh, you know, one of the things, because he's very involved in trying to get people elected to the Senate and take back the Senate in 2022, I specifically asked him, is Joe Biden the duly elected president of this country? I don't ask that every time. I ask it when I think it's appropriate. You know, all you can do is call it out. And certainly if anybody raises the issue, I, I, I'm trying to remember who it was. There was uh, somebody in the Trump campaign after the election back in November, December, in that period, and who kept talking about Joe Biden. And I said, you mean President-elect Biden? And he refused to say President-elect Biden. I think it was, uh, may have been Steve Cortez, but anyway, it was somebody in the, in the, in the Trump campaign. Um, you know, you can call it out and you can call people to account on it. That's all you can do. But, you know, I, I, conspiracy theories abound. I think that they really unfortunately flourished in the last four years. And uh, I'm not sure that you can dissuade people. I'm sure there are plenty of people who to this day, if you could you know, pass a lie detector test, is this election stolen from uh, Donald Trump? They would say absolutely, and they would believe it. Oh, you, you talked about your, your years in the media. So when you first started, there was ABC, NBC, CBS, PBS, there were Cable, right, cable just beginning, no bloggers, no, no internet. Um, how has that, how's that changed the, the life of a reporter? How oh, it's changed the life of a reporter? The, 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 the pace of the job, the, 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 the new cycle has, has sped up tremendously in the time since you Oh, yeah. Here. I mean, I thought you were going to, when you say the life of a reporter, one of the things I was going to say is there are a lot more opportunities so you can move <laughs> from one place to another. There are more jobs out there. So yeah. that's good. Um, it, it certainly has changed. I, I'm unlucky in the sense that I'm my main job is I'm the host of a weekly show. Uh, my agent constantly tells me I'm the highest paid person uh, uh, in television news if you take it per hour that I'm actually on the air. So, well, I, you know, agents can spend anything. But, uh, you know, when I look at, for instance, we, uh, the, the guys who will cover the White House for us or for CNN, and they will be on the air and they will lead the hour every hour from nine in the morning until seven at night. And, you know, they're there on the, on the North Lawn uh, doing a report uh, at the top of every hour. And I think to myself, how do they have time to think? How do they have time to make phone calls, to report, to write, to, to you know, but because they're on the air, I mean, it just has changed that night and day. When I was the chief White House correspondent for NBC covering Reagan from 82 to 88. I, my job, I mean, unless there was a special event, but my job basically was to do two minutes on, on, for, for Tom Brokaw at 6.30 at night. That was it. I, and, and I thought I was overworked, you know, and to see what people are doing now, it's, uh, it's extraordinary and I'm not sure, I mean, I guess I'd be able to do it because you wouldn't have any choice, but it would certainly be different than anything I've ever done. Another huge change, right? When you started, the, it was it was sort of a canon that, that your own personal opinion was not part of the story and people were not supposed to know how you thought about a story. Now we live at a time, especially in the world of cable, where it's very clear, I think, for the hosts of the primetime shows at MSNBC or Fox or others, you pretty much know what their point of view is about a story and what their point of view about with whom they're talking. Um, do you some people say it's better. It's better the audience should know how you feel. It helps to frame the discussion. You're kind of old school in that regard, why? I'm old school in every regard. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I distinguish between news and opinion. I mean, it's become clear, and I th actually think Fox does a reasonably good job in distinguishing between the two. You know, seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night, it's, it's opinion. And I think most people understand it's opinion. I don't, you know, I, I, I hope people distinguish between 
what Tucker Carlson and Sean Hannity do and what I'm doing. Um, what, what concerns me, I don't have a problem with that. What concerns me more is when it, when it has seeps into or floods into what I consider you know, what should be basic news coverage. And, and this gets to a larger issue. I, I, you know, I, I, I'm very opposed to what Donald Trump did in trying to delegitimize the media. And in February of 2017, when he put out that the, the tweet that said the fake news media, and then he put in parentheses, CBS, ABC, NBC, Washington Post, New York Times, uh, are, are the enemy of the people. I was horrified by that. Um, on the other hand, I do think that his actions and his attacks gave a lot of my uh, colleagues in the, in the straight news media, the, the, the news side, as opposed to the opinion side, a feeling that they could push back and you know there are there are people that I saw, and you know I'll take an example, uh, Jim Acosta, who was the White House correspondent for CNN, I think was was wildly opinionated in a way that when I was covering Reagan, Sam Donaldson, and Leslie Stoll, and I would never have dreamt of being, and and you know I think that was a mistake that we felt that his attacks on the media allowed the straight news media to attack back and be advocates back. And my reaction was, no, we gotta, we gotta play it straight and we, we gotta stay in our lane. And just because he's an antagonist doesn't mean that we have to be an antagonist back. He still should be calling balls and strikes. And so I think, let me incidentally say, I think there's, I see bias on the front page of the New York Times and I see bias on the front page of the Washington Post where I see uh, uh, adjectives uh, used that, you know, I, I, I'm not comfortable with. I, you know, it, it's, uh, maybe it's old school, but I think that, you know, you put things in context and if uh, a guy says something and it's demonstrably false, like the idea of the election was stolen from Trump, I think that's perfectly legitimate to put in. But, you know, you see other stuff, rambling uh, comments, rants or whatever, you know, that are just loaded phrases that I don't know that you need to include. So when a, when a headline says Trump comma lying again comma is that too strong to say he's a liar as opposed to he, he he's not tell, saying something that isn't true? Well, I wouldn't do it as a headline. I mean, I think you certainly can say it's not you know you can say it's not true. Uh, you know, I, I maybe that's a little bit uh, <laughs> prim uh, and proper of me, but but uh, which is not something I'm usually called. But but you know, I I I, I kind of feel like. Let the facts, let the weight of the evidence do it. You don't have to pile on. Uh, I remember the first, the second day, Trump was elected on a Tuesday night. It was three in the morning, Wednesday morning. The Thursday, New York Times, the headline was, uh, the banner headline across the entire New York Times was, students and foreign leaders gird for Trump presidency. Uh, look it up. It's, it's pretty close to that. It's uh, almost an exact quote. And, you know, my reaction was that that to be the lead headline in the New York Times. I mean, you know, Trump's the president, his agenda, what does it mean for the country? But to write in such an oppositional lead, I, 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 I kind of feel like give the reader or the viewer credit. They'll get there. You don't have to keep pushing them. So I guess it's an interesting question about can we, to what degree can we restore our trust in the institution of the press? It's dropping along with a lot of other institutions in our country, but it's incredibly low now and he has people for their respect for journalists and for the press and media. Do you see that being restored and if so, how? Yeah, I'm very concerned about it. You know, it's interesting. I, a lot of people come up to me or did before COVID when we, yeah. I was out in front of a lot of people, you know, going to an airport or something and they say, and they used to say to me, um, you know, I really like how fair you are. I really like how even handed you are. I really like how, uh, uh, you know, you, you're the cop on the beat. You can't hold both sides to account. And while I like being praised as much or maybe more than the next guy, I actually found it very sad because when I started out, actually appropriately at the Boston Globe in 1969, my first job out of college, um, fairness, and accuracy was what kept you from getting fired. That was like the lowest common denominator. 
you know, it was like spelling words right. You were fair to both sides. And the idea that this should now be an object, a, a, a source of praise, uh, I think is a really sad commentary about where the news media has gotten. So uh, would I like to see it go back? Yes, but, but the problem is, Neil, is it, and cable news it, it certainly does it to a greater degree, but I think frankly, all of the news media does to some degree. The business model, the most successful business model now is to take a side. You know, yeah. CNN takes a side, MSNBC takes a side, Fox takes a side, and people want to watch or read the outlet, the news media platform that agrees with them and that, and that uh, you know, gives weight to what they already uh, believe. And so, you know, I think pushing back on that and saying, no, we're gonna go, we're gonna play it straight, we're gonna be even-handed, we're gonna tell both sides of the story and you're not gonna be able, you know, one side take great comfort and other side great opposite, great, you know, anger in what we say, that just doesn't seem to be the business model in, the, in, the, in journalism today. And that, that's terribly sad. And I'm not sure that I see a ready uh, or easy or, or, or quick way for that to return other than to focus on PBS. So we're gonna to go to student questions. Thank you, Chris. We're gonna to go to student questions in a minute. I just want a kind of quick lightning round for you. Uh -huh. you interviewed a, a ton of people. So I wanna ask you, is there a best interview or a best moment that you think about? For me or anybody? No, for you. For, for you? me? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, there, there are a bunch. I interviewed Putin uh, in the Russian embassy in Helsinki just after his summit in 2018 with Donald Trump. And there were two moments there that I really was pleased. One, you'll think of, you, you know, we, Alan kind of referred to it, but didn't really make it clear. You and I used to work together at, on an ABC show with Sam Donaldson and Diane Sawyer called Primetime, and you were a terrific producer. And we all learned tricks there. And one of the tricks we learned was props. And that when you do an interview, a prop is an invaluable thing. So three days before I did the interview with Putin, um, the, uh, the Mueller's office, the special counsel's office, had indicted 12 members of the GRU, which is Russian military intelligence. And as soon as I saw this press conference, I was actually in Helsinki at the time, I said to uh, one of my staffers, print the indictment. And she sort of looked at me like, what? Print the indictment. So I'm sitting there with Putin and, you know, I'd done a bunch of things about the summit. Now I'm gonna get to the whole question of Russian interference. And so, this is not a lightning round. I'm taking a long time. It's a very slow lightning. And so I, I not only said, started to talk about, uh, you know, the allegations, but I said, in fact, Mr. President, and I take out from my pile of papers of questions, the indictment, and I start reading from it. And then, being a smart ass, I hand it over to him. And he looks at me like, if we were in Moscow, I would know how to settle this. Uh, and it, I, it's like, would you like to look at it? And he, and there was a gasp in the room. There were, there, not only was our, our crew there, there was also a Russian, uh, you know, Kremlin film crew that was taping it. And, you know, you could hear a gasp in the room like, whoa. And he just sort of, you know, batted my hand, like put it there on the table. But I was kind of proud of that, you know, I thought, and I will say that up to that point, and you know, we've, you've all seen uh, Putin when he's kind of the slouchy guy in the back and he looks like he's bored and how, when is this going to end? From that moment on for the next half hour, I had his undivided attention and those piercing ice cold blue eyes. So I, I was pretty pleased with that moment. Is there a, is there a worse, not counting this interview, is there a worse moment? Well, you, you know, uh, one I remember, Michelle Bachman was running for president in, boy, that's pretty, that's an amazing sentence to say, isn't it? Uh, back in, I think it was 2012. And there was a moment when she was actually leading the Republican field. Romney ended up being the nominee. And, you know, Michelle Bachman was a pretty right wing uh, congresswoman from Minnesota. And at, near the end of the interview, I, one of the points I wanted to make was in fact, she was pretty experienced. She was a lawyer and she'd been a, a, a tax attorney at the IRS for a number of years. 
And so I was, I was gonna say to her, I had planned to say, you know, there are some of your critics who say you're a flake. And I had actually her, intended it to be kind of a soft question at the end of a fairly contentious interview. Uh, but as I, we're near the end of time, you know, this is all the things that go into your head as you're conducting an interview. And I just said, are you a flake? And you talk about reaction online. I mean, I must have gotten a thousand emails. How dare you? Uh, so that was a least favorite moment. Great. I'm going to go to cut to some students who want to ask you questions. And I think Maya is first. Hi, Mr. Shapiro and Mr. Wallace. I'm Maya. Um, I'm a freshman here at Tufts. And my question is, how do you keep your own opinion and bias out of how you deliver the news, such as even in your tone of voice questions and emphasis on certain stories? Uh, it's a very good question. And, and I'm going to give a slightly... Uh, weird uh, a, a metaphor analogy to explain it. It's just sort of a level of professionalism. You know, if you were a plumber and you were sent over to fix a leak in somebody's house, uh, you wouldn't sit there and think, well, gee, I like the drapery or not, or the woman treated me right or not. I, you know, you just would, you'd do a good job and you'd, you'd, uh, you'd, you'd fix the, 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 the sink, the leak. and. And you know, and I obviously some of this has to do with um, with with having had a long experience and a lot of years. But um, you, you know, you you I have opinions. I vote. I know there's some people. Uh, there was an editor of the Washington Post who, who purposely didn't vote. I always thought that was ridiculous. And if you you know your professionalism and and effort towards uh, objectivity was so fragile that voting was gonna tip you over. I thought you shouldn't be in the business to begin with. Of course, I've got opinions, but you know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm sure I'm not perfect, but I keep uh, myself out of it. And the other thing is, I'm basically a contrarian at heart. I think Neil would agree with that. Okay. And you know, if I'm talking to, my feeling is that these politicians, uh, senators, uh, cabinet officials, people in the White House, politicians running for office, they have a huge machine that's there to tell their side of the story. That's there to, to um, you know, to to uh, spin, give them talking points. So I kind of view my role as being the cop on the beat, sw swinging a nightstick and trying to keep them honest. And and you know that my I generally think they're going to tell their side of the story, and I'm going to try to put them through their paces, and 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 not oppose them, but ask them sort of about contrary points of view or pushback to their to their arguments or their policies and let them react in real time. Let's go to Sean. Sean. Hi, Mr. Wallace. Thank you for coming to speak with us. Um, I'm a sophomore mechanical engineer. And my question is, what are your expectations for the GOP leading up to 2022? Um, I think it's going to be fascinating to see because, um, it, generally speaking, if you look back over history in the first midterm after a new president, uh, that president's party does poorly in Congress. They lose seats in the House and they lose seats in the Senate. And given that they have no margin for error in the Senate and about three or four seat majority in the House, uh, you know, any kind of loss and the Republicans take back the uh, Congress. Um, having said that, I think that, that, you know, the big question for Republicans is going to be the, the health, the strength, the unity of the party going into 2022. There, there does seem to be, despite efforts to play it down, a real division between sort of the establishment, traditional Republicans and the Trump Republicans, to the extent that this week, uh, President Trump Sent a, had his lawyers send a cease and desist letter to the Republican National Committee, the Republican Senate Committee, and the Republican House Committee, and say, do not raise money using my name, Trump's name. Uh, and I don't think there's any question, he's basically already promised it in the CPAC uh, speech, that people that he perceives as being insufficiently loyal to him, especially, for instance, the 10 Republicans who voted to impeach him, uh, he's going to primary them. He's going to put up opponents. And we saw this in 2010 with the Tea Party. Sometimes when you have a more extreme person 
running against the establishment candidate in a Republican primary, they beat them, but they move so far to the right that they then are vulnerable to the Democrats in the general election. So I think the story of the, the fortunes of the Republican Party in 2022 is very much up for grabs. Next, we're going to go to Colleen. Hi, uh, I'm Colleen. I'm a first term student, sorry, student in Fletcher's Global Business Program. Uh, my question is, as consumers, we vote with our dollars, but as media consumers, how can we responsibly vote with our views, uh, both in supporting freedom of the press, but within the larger context of the age of misinformation? Well, I, I would say two things, and, and one of them is, you know, as a marketing person, you're sort of talking, how can you affect the market? But I'm also thinking of it in terms of what's the most constructive way for you to become an informed citizen by how you consume the news. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, individually, there's not huge impact, but the answer is uh, the, the television news is a business, the news business, and it's very responsive to ratings. Responsive to ratings, first of all, they, uh, the, you know, they, the executives read them, the people on air read them, the uh, advertisers read them. If people stop watching or fewer people watch uh, a particular channel or a particular show, uh, they're gonna suffer in the ratings and they will therefore suffer in advertising. And, you know, so in a sense, you can, you can vote with your, you know, with your remote control. Uh, in terms of, um, but that, that's slow. I mean, I don't know that there's much other way. I mean, people talk about boycotts every once in a while. And, you know, I, I, it, it's something I'm not going to endorse, but, I'd, you know, it's a free market out there and people do what they want. Um, in terms of as a consumer, one of the things I always say, and, you know, there was some god awful s statistic a, a number of years back where they asked people, you know, what, who do you read on the op-ed page of the newspaper? And it turned out conservatives read conservative columnists and liberals read liberal columnists, and they didn't tend to read the other. Uh, I always say, watch or read something that challenges your view of the world. If you're a liberal and you love the New York Times, read the editorial page of the Wall Street Journal. If you're a conservative and you love uh, Fox News, read the front page of the New York Times. Um, you know, I think it, it, there's an old cliche, uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the famous Harvard professor and then US Senator said, you know, where you're entitled to your own opinions, but you're not entitled to your own facts. And I, I worry, and this gets back to uh, something Neil asked me earlier, you know, that people have their own facts, like was this election stolen? Um, and I, I just think as I, I do it, uh, you know, I watch, uh, I go out of my way to read a, a variety of newspapers um, of different ideological stripes. I watch the, the special report, which is the main political news show on Fox at six o'clock, but I always am sure to watch a broadcast network, uh, usually NBC um, mm -hmm. at, as well. And, and it's actually quite remarkable, the different views that you get watching one than the other. And I think that does nothing but serve me well because you know, you're not just getting one uh, organization's view of the world and interpret, you know, and, and sense of how they play it, what's important and what isn't. You're you're getting sometimes a contrary view. And I, you know, I usually the truth lies somewhere in the middle. Thank you. Uh, Karen. Yes, hi, uh, Neil and Chris. Thank you for speaking to the Tufts community today. Uh, my name is Karen Wiedemann. I work at the Fletcher School and I teach and coach graduate students on finding careers globally. And as a coach, I have to ask powerful questions all day long. So my question to you, which I hope is at least a little bit powerful, is how have you, Chris, perfected the art of asking questions over the years? Um, the, the answer is, I don't know that I perfected it, but I've certainly, I, I work on it very hard. And, and, and I, there are a couple of keys, I would say. One is preparation. One of these, uh, I very much got from my father. 
which is, look, if I'm interviewing the Secretary of State, speaking of the Fletcher School, I, I clearly don't know as much of, as the Secretary of State about, about US diplomacy and international relations. But I do have one advantage, and that is I know what I'm gonna ask and the Secretary doesn't know what I'm gonna ask. So I don't have to know everything. I just have to know about the subjects I'm gonna ask about. And I have a very good researcher, I call her Chris's brain. And uh, I, you know, I will really hone in if I'm gonna talk about the state of US Chinese relations, I'm really, you know, gonna hone in on on you know what are the key issues there? What is the the point? What what is the policy that the Biden administration, the new secretary, is is pushing? Mm-hmm. What's the pushback to that? What has he said in the past? What you know? I, I'm really aware of that. Now, when it comes to actually fas- fashioning the question, one of the things that I think is to make the quest- question as bulletproof as possible, and by that I mean. You, you, you want to keep it as focused and as narrow and tight, not necessarily narrow or tight in terms of the subject you're talking about, but narrow and tight in terms of the way it's phrased and the premises. I once interviewed um, Margaret Thatcher when she was the uh, prime minister of Britain. And one of the things that I found was she was delighted to, you know, if there was an imprecision in your question, she, instead of answering the question, she would address the imprecision. And, you know, I, when I used to work at NBC, I remember one time Tom uh, Brokaw saying to me uh, that, you know, one of the great questions is, what do you think of? And, you know, there's somebody in the, in the news. And as a matter of fact, I did that with Maggie Thatcher. I was interviewing her in 1982. Uh, uh, Israel had just invaded Lebanon. She was at the United Nations. Uh, I was a co-anchor of the Today Show and I went over to interview her at the UN hotel. And I said to her, Prime Minister, what do you think of Menachem Begin who was the head of Israel and had launched the invasion? And in, and in about a 10 question interview in which her answer was out before my question was finished. That was the one moment where for a second I kind of had her on her heels because it, it, it was wonderfully brief and precise. What do you think of? And you know, he had to come up with an answer. Um, so the point being, there's a lot of thought that goes into, and when I'm writing my questions, and you know, I, I write the questions, doesn't mean I'll always ask the question as written, but I, I go in with a blueprint every Sunday. And as I'm sitting there on Saturday writing the question, I will hone it and you know, I will uh, write it and then I'll, break it down or I'll add something or, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll just, I, I do the research first and then I think, how do I get to the nub of the issue and the greatest likelihood that I will get a reason, a, a serious news making answer from them. And then the other, the other thing I'd say quickly is I almost view oftentimes the question as almost the throwaway. The key is listen and then pick up on the, on the follow-up, that the follow-up oftentimes is where you, you're able to make the news and create the moment. Well, Chris, we have, we have one more question, but I want to interrupt before I let Molly ask the last question, and that's this. We've heard you talk about the love you have of your profession, what a great interview you, you are. People may be surprised to know that you weren't necessarily going to be a journalist. At one point, you're really thinking about going to law school. Looking back, any regrets that I'm not talking to instead of Chief Correspondent Chris Wallace, you're not Chief Justice Chris Wallace? <laughs> no, you know, uh, I, I, I'd love to be able to sort of throw myself on the couch and say, oh my God, what a mistake I made. This has been the best way to make a living I can imagine. I mean, first of all, new. So it necessarily is kind of interesting or it wouldn't be on the front page of the paper or the lead of the evening newscast. I mean, in the course of my life, I've I've, uh, you know, went with Reagan and, and, and to the four summits with Gorbachev. I spent a week with Mother Teresa in Calcutta just after she won the Nobel Peace Prize. I've been all over the world. I've been in the Great Hall of China. You know, I've been an eyewitness to history. I've made some news. I've gone on some adventures, some of them with you. Uh, it's a great way to make a living. I, I, I cannot imagine. Now, on Friday morning when I haven't booked the Sunday show because we can't get a Republican to go on, 
that's not so good. But generally speaking, it's it's been uh, just a wildly entertaining adventure. Well, so we're going to last uh, one last question, um, uh, and it's Molly. Hello, Neil. Hello, Chris. Thanks so much for taking my question. I'm not affiliated with the university at all, but I became familiar with Tisch College when Dean Solomon came to speak to a group of grassroots activists that I'm affiliated with in New York City. So I'm happy to be here today. Uh, my question has to do with the disinformation and the misinformation that's being propagated on social media. And if you have any thoughts on how we can counter that. Well, it's a huge it's a huge problem. Um, <laughs> this is going to make you think I'm an irredeemable Luddite. I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on Facebook. Not on Instagram. I'm not on any of those things. And, uh, you know, occasionally somebody will say, well, something's happening, something's trending, or there's this news break, and I miss it. But let me say, in all the years since all of those platforms became very popular, uh, those those second thoughts or those regrets are few and far between. Now, I, you know, am I sticking my head in the sand? Yes. You know, I guess in the end, um, and clearly we've seen, you know, cases, instances, a lot of cases where it's been dangerous and, and you know, downright uh, threatening to see the disinformation as we saw on January 6th. But generally speaking, I, I guess, you know, being in the business that I'm in, I believe in the kind of the, the, the marketplace of ideas. And yes, you know, QAnon and this, these crazy conspiracy theories uh, can prosper in certain shadows. But, you know, I think the truth eventually comes out. And, and the, the alternative to that, which would be censorship and, you know, uh, blacking people out, saying that they can't get their message out or they're, they're kicked off this platform. I, the thing I worry about is that just, they're gonna find another place. You know, it's like water in a, in a leaky basement. It's gonna find its own level. And I worry you just, you just drive folks from the left or the right uh, further underground into deeper and darker corners that where their, their misinformation, disinformation is not as readily countered. So sure, I'm concerned about it, but I, I'm not, I, I, I worry that some of the potential cures people talk about are worse than the dangers from, from, from what exists on the internet in a more open way right now. So I wanna be conscious of, of, of the clock. Chris, I, I can't thank you enough. The one disadvantage of not being given person is I can't uh, have everybody in the auditorium stand up and applaud and thank you. But we all do. Thank you so much for your time uh, and for being a guest here. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you all. I'm so sorry that we didn't get to do this in person on the Tufts campus. But uh, Neil it was, I'm doing, I, I, I am doing this because Neil it was such a wonderful friend and such a great producer that uh, when he called and said, will you do this? I, I couldn't say no. And uh, I'm delighted. This has been a very interesting, entertaining and useful hour. So thank you all. Thank you, everybody.